This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Customers calling saying they got several ACs down, but I'm starting on this one. This is one of their bar ACs, okay? So the first thing I did was I don't ever power the unit down. Because this older unit has a compressor lockout, it kind of has like mechanical logic, okay? So if a pressure switch was to open, high pressure, low pressure, or a freeze stat, or if the compressor doesn't run after a certain period of time, that switch, that compressor lockout board locks the system out mechanically um, via a holding relay, okay? So first thing we're doing, we walk up to the unit. I've got 25 volts from common to R, okay? Next thing I wanna do is I wanna test to see if we are in compressor lockout. So I go from common to X and I get nothing, okay? So that tells me that we are not in compressor lockout, okay? Um, we can proceed further. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my thermostat, I mean my meter on common and we're gonna go to Y1. Do we have a call for cooling is what I'm testing, okay? The thermostat downstairs, first off you've got 24 volts coming from this transformer. It runs through some logic in the unit, then it goes downstairs via the thermostat wire and then comes back up. The thermostat, think of it as a light switch. When the temperature gets where it's supposed to get, the light switch turns on and it tells the unit to turn on. In this situation, from common to Y1, which is my call for cooling, I have a call for cooling, 25 volts. So that means that the thermostat is telling this unit to turn on, but for some reason it's not, okay? I don't think we're off on low pressure because we would be off on compressor lockout. Now what you don't know is that after this system had been operating for many years, we came in and we put in Jade Economizer systems on this unit, okay? So we have, um, I believe right here on maybe this wire right here, this thermostat wire, it's coming from the Honeywell Jade Economizer assembly. So we're gonna go over and have a look at that. This unit is economizing right now. So it's occupied, Y1 is on. It's going through a, Y1 out is off. It doesn't have a Y2. We're just letting it scroll through its logic. Mixed air temperature is 67 degrees. That's inside the blower assembly. Outside air is 67 degrees. And it's economizing right now. So it is kind of cool outside. So let's verify that those sensors are accurate. That's gonna be my next step. So I'm gonna throw a thermometer out here. So it's early morning. It's gonna to get to almost 100 today, but it does look like it's pretty accurate, 69 degrees. But honestly, the uh, outside air temperature should be a lot lower than 67 degrees before it bypasses because typically you want to maintain about a 72 degree building and you need temperature differential. You don't want it just saying, well, it's 72 outside, let's bring in. No, you need, you know, at least a 10 degree temperature differential between the outside air and the inside air. And uh, we don't really, because then when you bring in body heat, it's going to take forever for it to cool the building down. So. The outside air temperature, the set point needs to be a lot lower than 67 degrees. So let's look into that. In our settings, it says that the dry bulb outdoor air temperature is set to 70 degrees. I'm gonna go ahead and change that because that's too high. We need that to set down to like 60 degrees. Now the customer didn't give me very much direction. They said they have an AC number, but they said the entire building was hot. So more than likely they've lost one or two ACs and this has several small ACs, so that affects the whole building. It looks like this unit's working. Uh, the economizer wouldn't have been the problem, it just happens to be cool outside right now, so I lowered the economizer set point. But my supply air temperature is 48 degrees. Uh, we know that the return air temperature was about 70, because that's what we were reading. So I don't think we have a problem with this unit, so it's more like a triage situation. We're gonna go ahead and put this one together and move on to the next one. I'm not gonna go any further because I'm looking for obvious things. Now, once I get obvious things fixed, if I wanted to dive further into these ACs, I could. 
I also have someone working on another. I have another person up on the building, so we're kind of tag teaming these ACs going through them together. All right, this one right here um, is also running. I just put my thermometer in it. We've already got a 50 degree supply air temperature and it's dropping even more. Again, it's about 70 degrees in the building. So I don't think there's a problem with this. So that takes care of their bar. Now we're gonna start over here at that unit and then work our way around and make it over to this unit too. This unit, I'm, I'm remembering something. This guy has a uh, is not running if I remember right. And I believe there was a refrigerant leak on the compressor that we found like during the winter and they didn't want to address it. They wanted to wait till the summertime. So I know we're gonna have to change a compressor on this one, but we're gonna keep going over to these guys right here. This guy is not working. So first thing I do is I prove that the transformer is giving us 24 volts from R to C. We're good to go, okay? Then I'm gonna go from C to X to see if we have any open limit switches and we do not. So then I'm gonna go from C to Y1 and I'm gonna prove that the thermostat is calling it it is, okay? So the next step is it's getting lost after this, right? So we've got power here, it goes into the economizer, then it comes out of the economizer and goes through the logic and pressure controls and everything. So let's go over here to the economizer assembly. And I've already got it opened up over here. So it might get kind of loud. Outdoor air sensor error. So our outdoor air sensor is bad on this one. And it's not allowing the compressor to turn on. Uh, it's it a minute ago I was reading negative 37 so it said okay to economize so very common on these things for the outdoor air sensors to fail if you open this up and this up it goes right down in here and that's the outdoor air sensor right there and they just get very susceptible to uh, outside ambient issues so we're gonna go ahead and change that sensor let's go see if I have one in my van and I bet you once we change that it'll start reading the accurate outside air temperature and then the unit will run all right, I do not have the sensor for this. I'm actually gonna go pick it up. Um, I just got all the information on this compressor. I'm gonna pick this up at the same time. I just looked at my local supply houses. Now, what's in here is an old Carlisle compressor and they were actually notorious for this happening. It's leaking out of one of the welds on the side. Um, I don't know if that's a soft plug or a weld on the Carlisle, but it's on the back side. So, this guy will go ahead and pick up a new compressor, we'll change it to 407C, we'll put in a new dryer and hope that the condenser is not restricted. I don't know, we'll have to see. We'll make sure we get a new one of those. Um, and uh, I'm just checking to see if the TD is good on this one before I leave. 49 degrees, yeah. So, um, now again, that's not like 100% this unit's doing everything it's supposed to be doing, but I'm triaging these units, right? Because I didn't know what was going on. So this guy's gonna be fine. Uh, FYI, if you have a sensor that has failed, if you disconnect it, the unit will turn on. But if the sensor's connected, sometimes it can read. So this unit was like turning on and off. So um, between this unit and this unit not working, that's gonna affect their entire dining room. Now, I haven't seen for sure if this one works. I'm gonna let my other technician check this unit out uh, when he's done working on the kitchen AC and I'm gonna go get all the parts that I need. So I'm gonna pick up a compressor and the outdoor air sensor for this one. I got the new zone sensor installed. Now we're reading 78 degrees outside air. So this AC is done. I'm gonna put it back together, button it up, get the work order signed for this one. Um, we're still working on the kitchen AC. I've got someone doing that and then we're gonna I got the compressor for this one So we'll jump on that here in a minute, too. All right now. I haven't shown you anything on this AC I have someone else working on it, but we have a, uh, a Fuse that has blown on here now this fuse has blown before I've had another technician a long time ago Come out here and change the fuses on it couldn't find a reason so I busted out the the insulation tester the mega ohm meter, okay? We tested this guy, it was good to go, okay? We test this guy, and it's testing bad, okay? So we're gonna hit insulation test, and look, we're testing with 526 volts, we have 32 mega ohms, 61 mega ohms. We have an intermittent insulation issue inside this guy. The compressor was just running. It was running, and the unit actually satisfied. But intermittently, this compressor is shorting to ground. Now. Um, insulation tests 
can be a little tricky because they can also sense high moisture content in the system. So you you want to be cautious about trusting just because the the meter says bad compressor what is it actually doing okay you want to be sure you test that don't just let that be your only thing okay um, we're going to go ahead and uh, talk to the customer about replacing this compressor i know that there is no moisture in the system we're the only people that are working on it we don't have high moisture content um, there's definitely something going on within this compressor Lots of bouncing around today. Um, so the kitchen AC, we turned it back on for now. It's an intermittent short. We're definitely gonna change the compressor, but um, we're gonna let it keep running while we're here. Uh, we're getting started on this guy. Now this guy said again is leaking on one of these, uh, I think it's a soft plug on the back. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and replace that compressor. We're also gonna split this condenser. So I pulled the top off the unit. Um, depending on how difficult the compressor change is, if we have to do a lot of repiping, we might pull the whole condenser out. If not, I'll just get the compressor out, put in a new dryer, then put this back in. So uh, this guy should be completely void of refrigerant by now. I believe it just had a slow leak. Let's see if it's even got refrigerant left in it. Nope, nothing. I'm pushing it right now. So no refrigerant left in it. So we'll get this compressor pulled out. We'll get the new one brought up to the roof and then maybe we can clean up some of this oil mess on the bottom. If you come over here, um, there's a lot of oil over here from when it just leaked out slowly. The Kanitsch fan motor was running. So contactors, they look like they're fairly new, but I don't know how good they are inside. So we'll give those a look too. All right, we're getting this guy on sweat. We got the new compressor up here. For the most part, it looks like it's gonna match up. This is a Copeland. I went with a Copeland compressor. I did use the cross-reference in the Copeland mobile app to find the right compressor because you can't get these Carlisles anymore. I believe even Carrier changes them over to Copeland if I remember right. Um, something I wanted to point out, there was the slightest bit of vapor still in here. And if you look, see if it comes across on the camera or not, Look in the shadow, right here, of that. See, it's not gonna show itself, there it goes. You see that tiny little ripple right there? That's the shadow of the, the sun reflecting off the gas that's still venting out of this guy. The point I'm trying to make is this guy never pulled atmosphere into the system. It was ever so slightly, it just went when I pulled the Schrader out. So. That's a good sign. That means that this oil isn't technically contaminated with moisture, which should make this change out a lot easier. So, This is very good because the entire system still has vapor coming out of it. I don't know if you guys can see the shadow right there of the vapor coming out of that. So what we're doing is, is we're doing the dryer because we've got the compressor out, makes it easier, right? So this one, this dryer is a little bit bigger. So when I go to fit it, if I put it right there, it sticks up too high. Or if I put it right there where it's gonna go, you see this is down too low right here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is, is just cut with the tubing cutter right at the top of this solder right here. Just cut that off, that much off, and then that'll make that dryer fit in there perfect. All right, we're trying to make it a little bit easier on ourselves. We braise the bottom side of the dryer out of the system. I'm doing this right here and then we're gonna jump onto the top and the rest of the filter dryer. Um, we're doing this without the compressor in place, that way it's easier. The tip that I'm using is a little bit big, so I'm kinda trying to be quick. I'm, I've got a rosebud tip for the big stuff. I'm a cheapskate, so I patch my solder sticks back together. Um, I don't have my Viper wet rag heat blocking compound, so I'm just using a towel. It's not the end of the world. If the dryer gets a little burnt, it's okay. The torch settings are a little bit off here.
adding a liquid line service port so we can get an accurate subcooling too. So we're getting the compressor brazed in at the moment. We ended up having to put a T right here, I mean a, a coupling right here. And we slightly tweaked this line down, but we've got some nitrogen flowing through. So we're looking good. So I always like to do the most difficult braze first, which is this back corner. So we do that, do that, and then we'll do the easy ones down here. All right, we are all brazed in. So this one, this one, we put a coupling right here to make up for what we needed. Because basically this guy um, we needed this out of our way to get the compressor out, so we cut it here. Um, put a Sportling catch-all 16 cubic inch dryer in there. We're all brazed up. We've got nitrogen flowing through. We're going to get our vacuum pump set up running. Uh, we're going to take a lunch while it's doing an evacuation, and then we'll clean the condenser and put the top on and charge it up. And cross our fingers and hope that, that uh, the fixed orifice metering devices on the liquid header aren't plugged up. Mm, there's not much I can do if they are. We had the nitrogen in the gauges up here, so we're gonna go ahead and do a standing pressure test while we're going to get all of our evacuation equipment. So I always put it in on the high side, let it go the natural flow, make sure it comes up on the low side, then I'll open the low side. But you just wanna make sure that it's actually not completely restricted, and it's not. So we're gonna pressurize this guy up, do a tightness test, and then, like I said, we'll be back with the evacuation stuff. We are set up, we had to improvise and put the vacuum pump on a bucket because the hose was a little too short. So I'm gonna start out with the suction line closed, see how fast it pulls down on the micron gauge, which would completely isolate this hose from the system. So let's go ahead and turn it on, see what happens. We'll go ahead and open up the gas ballast, and then we're gonna let it run and hopefully pull slightly down on this guy then I don't know we'll decide whether or not we need to open the other side up got some of the blue brightener cleaner from Viper using their gun and this stuff is going to do good at stripping all the oil out of the bottom of the unit and cleaning the condenser too so I'm going to go ahead and apply it we'll let it sit then we'll give it a rinse I'm trying to do this carefully without ruining all my stuff so just trying to be as efficient as possible we also got that dryer strapped up with a zip tie so all right so we're giving it a good little rinse been sitting on there for about three four minutes I don't want to let it sit too much longer we're gonna rinse it from all sides I've kind of got the condenser split apart a little bit too right now so you can clearly see the stuff coming out is gunk I sprayed the bottom of the unit all that good stuff so the wand really helps us to be able to get down in here and we'll get all different angles push it out from this side so nice and slow, make sure it's properly clean. Looking at about 600 microns on the micron gauge, so we're just gonna let that keep running. Just trying to rinse it all down. Since I had the top off the unit, I went ahead and rinsed out the drain pan, made sure it was nice and clear, blew out the trap. Um, a bunch of all that dirt right there was in there, so that's all rinsed out. So we're good on that. I'd love to redo that trap, but it's a problem for another day. Um, we're looking pretty good. About 700 microns, 750 right now, so we're gonna let it keep running. I'm um, probably gonna take a lunch and then just let that keep pulling down. All right, I just took the big vacuum hoses off. I'm currently in decay. Um, I'm pulling an initial vacuum on these, but the, it's not pulling on the gauges yet on the system. So those are still closed because we're in decay at about 793 microns and slowly rising. Um, so I'm pulling an evacuation on these hoses because I don't want them to have any atmosphere in them. That way when, uh, when um, I go to charge, we don't introduce anything we're not supposed to into the system, right? So clearly I've got something loose right now. Oh yeah, these guys. This is why we don't open the system till we're 100% sure. And then we pull the gauges down into a vacuum. Again, they're isolated at the core removal tools. Um, 
and let it pull down. So we're 2,500 microns. We'll let it pull down. I'm gonna go get some refrigerant. We're gonna introduce refrigerant to the system, do a leak check on it, put the top on. We're just kind of, you know, trying to multitask as much as possible. Then we'll open everything up and start the system up. All right, we are going with 407C. I currently, and we're currently putting the top on the unit. We're gonna go ahead and start charging this guy. So I put a couple 407C stickers. We'll get some paint markers out here in a minute too. Um, scale is zeroed out. We're looking for, I already purged everything all the way up to here. So we're gonna go ahead and open this and open this. And uh, we're looking for 12.5 pounds of R22. So we're probably gonna go to about 11.5 pounds and then dial it in via superheat when we're done with that. So go ahead and put it in on the high side. Letting it dump in there. Let me get that to actually show you guys. One pound. So we're just gonna let it dump what it can. Uh, we'll get the leak detector out here in a minute. All right, we're still charging. We're gonna do a leak check real quick using the field piece DR82. Gonna hit all my joints back here. Nothing, 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 nothing. Come up here to the compressor, nothing, nothing. So no leaks. We're putting a crankcase heater on and then uh, we're gonna drop the condenser fan motor in and hopefully get ready to start it up. All right, I've got the system running. Uh, switched everything over to my my job link probes and we're charging right now so I stopped right under eight pounds just a little like it's like seven pounds and some change so we're just gonna keep adding gas and we're gonna watch the superheat because we're looking for a target superheat on this guy because it's a fixed orifice metering device all right we are running really good so this is our system right here and we're calling for about five degrees of evaporator superheat because of the target. Okay, it's target superheat because it's a fixed orifice metering device. Um, it's kind of ranging a little bit right now. I might have overshot it just a little bit, but we'll let it kind of stabilize out. We've got about 12 degrees subcooling. That's true subcooling because I added a liquid line port. Um, about just under 100 degrees outside. We've got a decent approach temperature. Supply and return, we have a 23 degree temperature split. Airflow is about where it should be. I'm looking pretty darn good. This is a six ton unit. We're delivering right at that. This guy's looking great. So we got lucky that the fixed orifice metering device, there's our superheat, it's about 5.7 degrees. We got lucky the fixed orifice metering device was not plugged up on this guy. Um, all right, this is good stuff. 407C, like I said, we marked it. We're right about the factory charge just about give or take a couple ounces so pretty darn good all right so we're gonna go ahead and start cleaning all of our stuff up um, we're definitely gonna be changing the uh, walk or the compressor on the kitchen AC later but not right now we got a giant mess up here so we're gonna start cleaning our stuff up making sure everything's working and the customer is gonna be super happy because their dining room is gonna be kicking now well um, I went ahead and brought the compressor back to the shop or back to my house actually and uh, raised on some stubs real quick nothing fancy and I came back here to where I remember when I condemned this thing which was like a year and a half two years ago but uh it's leaking right here on this uh spot right here now I don't know if that's a soft plug or if that's like a a, a weld regardless these Carlisle compressors on the carriers always leaked right there back in the day we don't see a lot of the Carlisles anymore. Um, but yeah, they would always do that, so. So when you get these calls where there's like, you know, hurry, everything's down, don't panic, first off, right? Just go into triage mode and start looking for big things, right? So, you know, there may be, the, it, it's possible that there was problems with those ACs that were operating, but I wanted to triage the situation, go find the worst stuff, right? So I'm going through, boom, 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 found one problem, set the economizer's temperature at which it goes into full economized lower, you know, so boom, solved that problem. But, and then just worked our way through the issues until we found major problems, right? So we had one economizer sensor that was bad that wasn't allowing the unit to come on. We had a compressor bad on the kitchen AC, which I actually sent, um, someone back to go replace that compressor. I didn't do the job. 
uh, but that's already been taken care of too. And then I took care of the compressor that I knew was going to be, you know, was, was down. Um, <clears throat> in a situation like this, the way that the restaurants work, the kitchen AC was operating, so it wasn't an emergency. So I prioritized the AC that was out in the dining room that wasn't working at all. That's why I changed that compressor the day that you saw the video or in the video. And then I sent someone the next day to change the um, kitchen AC compressor. Okay. So, but you just kind of take your time. Again, don't panic. I know it could be overwhelming because you go out and there's five ACs. They say five ACs aren't working. Okay. Just start working your way through them one at a time, right? Focus on that AC. Go through it. Is it good? Okay. Move on to the next. Move on to the next. Move on to the next, you know? So just take it one AC at a time. Um, and like I said, just go into like triage mode, just looking for major issues. There really wasn't anything too crazy about this. I had already brought that compressor up to the customer previously. It was winter time. It, I think it was like a year ago, though. It's been a while. Um, but anyways, it was winter time and they didn't want to fix it for whatever reason. Um, I, you know, I don't know if it was a year ago because it might have been the end of last summer. I think that's what it was. I think it was the end of last summer and they were like, eh. We'll get through the winter. That's what it was. Anyways, but so I already kind of had an idea what it was. And it, they were so notorious for the Carlisles to leak in that exact same spot. It happened all the time. I've changed a lot of those Carlisle compressors because of that exact issue. There's no fixing that. You're not going to braze that shut or anything. Just change the compressor and move on, okay? Um, I uh, went ahead and converted it to 407C. I've been doing a lot of conversions to 407C lately as long as I'm doing oil changes um, and everything's been good. I get a lot of questions about what alternative refrigerants I use. I still use R22 to this day. <clears throat> we actually just bought a crap ton of it um, and, and just stockpiling it. Uh, but we still use it on refrigeration systems, on air conditioning systems. If we come up to an air conditioner that's low on refrigerant, we'll top off the charge with R22, uh, come back, fix the leaks, either continue to use R22, or if it has polyester oil in it, we'll go ahead and uh, put 407C. It just depends, okay? But I still use R22. Uh, the only alternative to R22 that I'm using at this moment is 407C. Now, I know I get messages and emails from all these different people. Use this, use this, use this. You don't need an oil change. Use this, use this. I like to follow the manufacturer's installation instructions. Uh, 407C says it works best with polyester oil. Now, I know that there's some people out there that say you can just add a little bit of polyester oil to the system. That's not the right way to do it, okay? <clears throat> and I want to dispel some myths, too. Because I recently watched a YouTube video of someone, and I know there's so much misinformation out there, but there's a, a another YouTuber, I'm not going to name him, but um, he made a video showing how he converts system over to 407C, and he adds 20% of the oil charge with polyester oil. So he just literally dumps polyester oil on top of the existing mineral oil, and he adds 20%. That's not how that works, Okay. Um, now, first off, you can mix the oils. It's not the end of the world, okay? But it's not supposed to be that way because, you know, different oils travel with different refrigerants, okay? So in a perfect world, you only want one oil in that compressor. The next thing is you don't want to add 20% more oil to a compressor. You can have problems if you have too much oil in a compressor. So don't listen to that myth where you just add extra oil. That's not accurate, okay? Okay. The only way to do it right is to remove the oil, put polyester in it, or change the compressor. Sometimes that might even be cheaper. Just change the compressor. The new one comes with polyester oil, then charge it with 407C. Um, you don't want to be mixing refrigerants ever. That is not accurate. You're not supposed to do that, period. I don't care if your best friend says that he did it and he's been doing it for 20 years and it works fine. It doesn't mean it's right. It's not right. You are not a chemist. You don't make your own refrigerants. There's no pressure temperature chart to follow if you mix refrigerants. It just doesn't make sense. So don't do that, okay? So I don't use any other alternatives as of this point, um, just 407C. And uh, like I said, I always just either change the oil or change the compressor, okay? So that's the way that I'm rolling. That's the the, the way that the manufacturers want you to do it, okay? Um, be very cautious trusting supply houses because supply houses oftentimes can give inaccurate information not all the time but sometimes they can um, I've been told several times by very reputable supply houses that 
Oh yeah, you can use this refrigerant. It works fine. Well, who says it works fine? Oh yeah, the last technician. Yet he's not the person that I want to be listening to. The only people that I want to listen to is the manufacturer Copeland, the manufacturer of the compressor, Carlisle, Tecumseh. Or I don't even think Carlisle exists anymore. But I mean, you know, lean on the manufacturer of the compressor and see what their recommendations are. Don't listen to the manufacturer of the equipment. Listen to the person that's standing behind their compressor. That's the person to listen to. Copeland doesn't approve very many additives for anything. Be very careful about trusting when you go into a supply house, and I know I'm going off on a tangent right now, but you go into a supply house <clears throat> and they have a, a leak sealant up on the wall, right? I'm pointing to the figurative wall right there. They have a leak sealant up on the wall and right on the leak sealant, it says OEM approved. That is such a stupid blanket statement. What does OEM approved mean? How many manufacturers are there? Which manufacturer approved it? Was it a compressor manufacturer or was it a manufacturer of an expansion valve? But you know, don't, there's so much misleading marketing material and it drives me nuts. The only person that should be telling you what to put in your systems is the manufacturer of the compressor, period. Okay, because they're the people that are standing behind that compressor. They're the people that are going to warranty it. Lean on them. Go. F I, I challenge every one of you to go to Copeland Compressors. Find your local Copeland rep, an actual Copeland rep, not a supply house, an actual Copeland rep, and ask them, which leak sealant does Copeland approve in their compressors? I'd love to see from a Copeland representative one of them say that they actually approve a leak sealant or a dye or uh, a flush or whatever, okay? Copeland doesn't approve very many things. And on top of that, some of the people, the manufacturers, Copeland might approve one particular additive under a certain circumstance, maybe in a chiller, maybe under certain evaporator temperatures, but it's not a blanket approval for everything. So you have to be very careful about misleading marketing material. Okay. Now that I went off on a tangent and started talking about everything else, but what was relevant to the video, let's get back to the video. So, um, nothing too crazy. Uh, system still running fine. All those ACs are back up and running. The customer's happy. All is well. Okay. I recently said in a video, I'm just going to keep saying it and stay tuned to, but, uh, if you go to my website, hvacrvideos.com, we just resupplied the hats. We've got a, a new, uh, basically we were running really low and we ran out for a few days, but we're all back in restock. So we're good to go on the hats. If you're interested in checking out hats, we have t-shirts soon to be not available yet, but very soon to be stickers available on the website. Um, so I need to figure out how to get them on my website. It's been a while since I've actually done that. I have two different styles of stickers. They probably won't be available for a couple more weeks, but we have a translucent sticker that basically is clear if I can show you guys. So that will be available soon. So it is a clear sticker, right? So there's translucent and then this one has a white background. So they'll be available soon, but I don't think realistically it'll be for a couple more weeks, but just stay tuned. Keep checking on the website, hvacrvideos.com. Uh, several other ways you can support the channel if you're interested in doing so. The easiest way to support the channel is simply watch the videos from beginning to end without skipping through anything. That's the simplest way. Uh, you can also support the channel via PayPal, Patreon, YouTube channel memberships. There's links in the show notes of the video. If you're interested in purchasing any tools, you can go to truetechtools.com. I have an offer code, big picture. <clears throat> that is one word. Uh, if you use that offer code, you get an 8% discount. I get a small commission from that. Uh, that's if you like what True Tech Tools has to offer. I've been purchasing from them for many, many years. They're a great company. Um, very, very nice people run the company. Uh, amazing people, actually. So really cool people. I love their um, their message that they're trying to spread and just in general they're just a good company so check out truetechtools.com if you're interested in purchasing any tools and that is it remember that um i typically go live on the hvac overtime youtube channel on friday evenings with my friends adam bill and joe about 6 5 p.m pacific um <clears throat> we usually do a, a just like a hangout live stream it's like a bunch of guys just going to the bar uh, then I also do work permitting live streams on my YouTube channel, uh, Monday evenings, about 5 PM Pacific, uh, this last week, actually yesterday, uh, I had my wife on 
my wife, Jill, and we kind of talked about how we live the HVACR life. So uh, just stay tuned. I really appreciate you all. Remember, be kind to one another, and uh, we will catch you on the next one, okay?